All right. Um, welcome, everybody, to the IS FMP Policy Board. It is February 1st. Um, this is the first part um, of our policy board meeting. We will be reconvening on Thursday, um, uh, Thursday afternoon. Uh, we have scheduled today um, uh, this portion of the policy board uh, to continue until 11.45. So if uh, I'd like to try to make sure that we conclude all of our business so people have time to uh, take a break before uh, Summer Flounder, Scup and Black Sea Bass resumes again at 12.45. Um, I'm going to jump right into the uh, uh, second agenda item, which is board consent uh, for approval of the agenda. Does anybody have any uh, issues with the agenda? Is there any new business to be brought before the policy board? There are no hands raised, Pat. Great. Um, I, we have consensus on the agenda. Uh, and then for approval of the proceedings from October 2020. Does anybody have any questions or comments on uh, on those notes from the those proceedings? No. Seeing no hands and hearing nobody's objections, uh, the uh, approval of the proceedings will will say that they've been approved by consensus. Thank you. Um, item three on the agenda is public comment. Uh, is there any member of the public that would uh, have a comment before? Has anybody signed up or is there anybody that would like to raise your hand from the public? I see no hands, Pat. Great. We're going to move it right along then. Uh, agenda item number four is review state membership on species management boards. Uh, I'm going to turn that right over to you, Tony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Maya, if you could pull up the presentation for state declared interest, that would be great. And while Maya is pulling that presentation up, um, I'll just give a little background. Um, each year, the states have the opportunity to declare interest in or out of species. Um, if you declare an interest into the species, um, then you are saying that your state has landings in those state waters, you have historical landings, you're part of the FMP, um, in the, the management unit of that FMP, and you want to um, start taking an active role in the fishery on the species management boards, um, whether that's through um, as species start to move north, sometimes that's through de minimis measures, and other times that is through active, um, active directed fisheries in those states. And if you can move to the next slide, Maya. Um, we had a significant number of changes this year. We hadn't had very many changes in the species declared interest in quite some time. And this year, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service withdrew from several species uh, managed declared interest, and that includes black sea bass, summer flounder, scup, bluefish, Spanish mackerel, tatog, weak fish, winter flounder, cobia, black drum, red drum, spot, spotted sea trout, and Atlantic croaker. Um, and I think you know, these were boards that the Fish and Wildlife Service were just not active on um, previously and wanted to devote their time and resources to those species that there are more interactions with the agency and the agency's science and um, goals and objectives. Uh, the state of Massachusetts has um, pulled out of the weak fish board due to the lack of the species in their state waters. They'll go ahead and hold on to the current regulations in the rec fishery and the commercial fishery as they are for now. Maya, move to the next slide, please. Um, and then there are several states that want to declare interest into some species. Uh, as everybody knows, this year the South Atlantic State Federal Species Management Board was split into two management boards this year. We now have the Pelagics Board, which is Covia and Spanish Mackerel, and we have the Cyanids, which includes um, spot, 
spotted sea trout, red drum, black drum, and Atlantic croaker. And with that split, we had a couple of states uh, want, wanting to declare into either Spanish mackerel and or cobia. Uh, so, and then um, Delaware has started to see an increase in spotted sea trout in the, both their commercial and recreational landings. And so therefore they feel as though they need to start participating into this fishery. Um, their rec landings uh, in the last five years have ranged anywhere from zero to 11,000 pounds. And they also have some commercial landings, but I believe they are confidential, so I'm not going to say those out loud. Uh, New York has um, declared into Spanish mackerel. Um, they are starting to see commercial landings in, in their state for Spanish mackerel. In the last couple of years, they've ranged from eight to 800 to 5,000 pounds. Um, Rhode Island is declaring into Spanish mackerel and cobia. Um, they are starting to see um, both Spanish mackerel and cobia commercial landings in their state waters, which are um, in both in the commercial fishery, but these are um, confidential landings. And New Hampshire has de asked to declare into the black sea bass fishery. Uh, New Hampshire is already in the management unit within the FMP for black sea bass. They receive an allocation and they are also required to keep um, regulations in place in the recreational fishery. They've been on this board before, withdrawn, and come back into and are asking to come back onto the management board. So that is my presentation, and I am happy to take any questions on any of these changes or go to the state or agency that has um, asked for changes. Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Tony. Is there any questions for Tony? I have Joe Semino. Go ahead, Joe. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Tony, I, if if I missed it, um, New Jersey's connection with spotted sea trout, uh, I had mentioned, and I know sending in speckled trout compliance reports already, but I didn't know if yep, that was... I apologize, Joe. Um, yeah, New Jersey is also declaring into the spotted sea trout as well. I somehow missed that in my, it should have been next to the Delaware. Thank you. Any other hands, Emerson, Tony? Emerson Hasbrook, Mr. Chair. Go, go ahead, Emerson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, I'm wondering when are these changes uh, um, effective? When do they when do they become effective? Is that going to start today, for instance? So, will New Hampshire this afternoon be sitting in on on the black sea bass discussion? If the policy board approves these changes, then they would be effective immediately. Thank you. Anybody else, Tony? Tony, I don't know why. Usually, I is there any way you can make the change so I can actually see the hands when they go up on my screen? Yep, sure can, Pat. That'd be great. I just got to find you in this list. There you go. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. Um, sorry about the noise. All right, Pat, you should be able to see hands. Perfect, great, thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands up at this time. Um, is, Tony, you think we can do this by consensus or do you want a motion? I think it would be good just to have a motion for the record and thank you Maya for adding that um, for New Jersey and it would it can be a general motion for the for the slate declared okay. word today you can um, you can see if there's no objection but just having a typed out motion for the record would be great yeah 
Okay. Would somebody like to make a motion uh, on this issue on the uh, declared interest? And Pat, don't forget you have to click on that little hand, the black outlined hand, in order to see to get all of the hands raised. And you had Tom Fody with his hand up, okay. and Ellen Tom. Bolin also had her right, hand I'll up. All right, I'll go to uh, Tom and then Ellen. I'll make the motion. A motion by Mr. Foley. Do we have a second? Uh, Malcolm Rhodes. Um, and Tom, if you could read that motion. Move to approve the changes to the species declared interest. Thank you, Tom. We have uh, a second. We have a motion by Mr. Foti and a second by Malcolm Rhodes. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Do you see Sheree's hand, Pat? Um, for some reason, I'm not seeing those, but Sheree, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just um, going to second the motion. Okay. Uh, motion's been seconded. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Hearing no discussion, is there any objections? Hearing no, seeing no hands, hearing no objections, the motion passes by consensus. Great, thank you very much. We will move to the uh, second, uh, or the next item on the agenda, which is to discuss recreational management reform initiatives. And I believe Julia Beatty is going to present on this one. Am I correct, Tony? That is correct. Hi, everybody. Yep, I'm here, ready to go. Um, Tony, uh, Council staff, we're checking the attendance list, and when you last did audio checks, I think there are a few council members still missing, so I don't know if any have joined, and if you'd want to do an audio check with any of them before I get started. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Uh, if there are any council members that have joined since we've gotten started, if you could raise your hand, that'll be the fastest way for me to find you. And, um, and, and just to note that Pat, that we would be, um, as I get here, uh, this, this portion of the meeting will now be convened jointly with the Mid-Atlantic Council and Mike Luisi is the chair of the Mid-Atlantic Council. So I'll start with you, Sarah Winslow, on um, your audio. If you Can you hear me? I sure can, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks. And Chris Moore. Hi, Tony. Hi. Uh, Kate Wilkie, you put your hand up again. And Tony Delernia, you would put your hand up again. Yes, uh, Tony, should there be, should my name be listed with a double zero in front of it or? Uh, I think Paul it's, okay, Tony, it's more for the beginning of the meeting that that is helpful um, at this point explaining how to change it is a little difficult and we can't change it for you unfortunately so you're fine Hello? just anytime you want to speak just raise your hand no well you'll know I'm here thank you Tony yep. <laughs> I'm sorry you know that. okay thanks Tom. thanks okay um, just one last check is Anybody not been able to do an audio check? If you raise your hand by clicking on the little hand button, Scott Lennox, go ahead. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, Scott. All right. So we will now convene the joint portion of this policy board to go over the rec reform initiative if that is good with you mr chairman yeah a absolutely and uh thanks for reminding me that we're now in a in a joint session um so i will turn it over to julia for her presentation great thank you mr chair and good morning everybody i have a fairly brief 
presentation. Um, next slide, please. So this is the outline of the presentation. First, I'm gonna um, briefly summarize the timeline of how we got to where we are today with the Recreational Reform Initiative. Um, I'll remind you of the goal of the Recreational Reform Initiative. I'll briefly touch on the prioritized topics and then we'll have a discussion of next steps. Next slide, please. So in terms of how we got to where we are today, um, the Recreational Reform Initiative um, evolved out of conversations that had been happening for several years, mostly focused on black sea bass and challenges with recreational management of that species. But the conversations really gained momentum after the Summer Flanners Cup Black Sea Bass Management Board Chair and Vice Chair at the time put forward a document titled A Strategic Plan for Reforming Recreational Black Sea Bass Management in the spring of 2018. And that document had a lot of suggestions for how to reform the management system, again, with a focus on black sea bass. And this stimulated a lot of discussion among the council and the management board. And ultimately, as a result of those conversations, the council and the management board agreed to form a joint steering committee to further develop some of those topics and to, to kind of open it up to consider all four jointly managed recreational species, not just black sea bass. So now it's summer flounder, scup, black sea bass, and bluefish. And the intent is to focus on um, improvements to the recreational management system that could apply to all four species, although some of the considerations might be slightly different depending on the species and stock status and things like that. So the steering committee consisted of um, staff and leadership from the council, the commission, and GARFO. And the steering committee, um, over a little bit more than a year, developed a goal statement for the recreational reform initiative and an outline of suggested priority topics. And in October of last year, the council and the policy board considered all of those topics that the steering committee um, put forward, as well as some other topics that had been discussed through some other ongoing actions. Um, and ultimately the council and board initiated a joint framework and addendum and an amendment to address several prioritized topics as part of the recreational reform initiative. And on a later slide, I will summarize what those topics are. But first, next slide. This is just want to remind you of the goal, like the overarching goal of the recreational reform initiative. Um, this was, statement was developed by the steering committee and approved by the council and the policy board. So the overarching goal is to have more stability in the recreational management measures. So the bag size and season limits for the four jointly managed recreational species, to have more flexibility in the management process and to have accessibility that is aligned with availability and stock status. And there's a little asterisk because the steering committee wanted to make it very clear that the intent is not to circumvent the requirement to constrain catch to the annual catch limit, nor is the intent to change the current method for deriving catch and landing limits as defined in the fishery management plan, but rather how can we work within those requirements um, to achieve these objectives of having more stability, flexibility, and accessibility for these fisheries. Next slide, please. So this table lists all of the topics that the council and board prioritized in October of last year when they initiated a joint framework and addendum and an amendment to address all of the topics shown on the screen here. So as you can see, there's many different topics. Um, and this table actually reflects a staff recommendation that some of the topics which were identified for inclusion in the framework and addendum be addressed through a technical guidance document. So that's what's shown in that first column there. Um, so specifically, this would include um, uh, developing a process for identifying and smoothing outlier MRIP estimates, evaluating the pros and cons of using preliminary current year MRIP data, and developing guidelines for maintaining status quo management measures. And if we can develop these topics through a technical guidance document, that would allow us to get this all done in a more efficient manner than if all of those things were also part of the framework and addendum. And we think this is possible because depending on the specific details considered, we think these topics are not gonna require a change to the fishery management plan. So we think they could be done through a technical document rather than a framework and addendum. 
So that would leave four topics in the framework and addendum, including a harvest control rule, which I will describe in more detail on the next slide. Um, another topic, which we're calling the envelope of uncertainty approach, where we would explicitly consider variability in the projected harvest estimate compared to the next year's recreational harvest limit when determining if measures should change. Another topic, which is developing a process for setting management measures that apply for two years at a time, stuff that we're calling multi-year measures here. And there would be a commitment to making no changes in the interim year. And then the last topic is considering making recommendations for federal waters measures earlier in the year than December of the prior year, which is our current practice. And um, I should say in the briefing materials, there's a lot more detail on what all of these mean. And I'm just briefly touching on all of them here just to remind you of what is part of all of these actions. So that leaves the last column here, which is the recreational reform amendment. And that amendment would consider um, recreational sector separation, which means managing the four higher sectors separately from the rest of the recreational sector. And there's a number of different ways you could do that, um, as well as actions related to recreational catch accounting. And this in could include things such as private angler reporting, changes to the VTR requirements, and other topics. Um, so again, these are all the topics that the Council and the Policy Board prioritized back in October, and this is a suggestion of how to put them in three different bins to help get everything done in the most efficient manner, manner possible. Um, and I wanted to note that this binning, especially of those first two bins, isn't necessarily set in stone. Some things might have to get shifted around between those first two columns, depending on future considerations related to the specific changes that are desired. Um, so it might be determined that something might need a change to the accountability measures, which would put it in the framework and addendum category. Or if something's more just guidelines related to how we use the data, then it could go to the technical guidance document um, category. But this is our, you know, this is what we're thinking right now for how we think it should bin it. But just wanted to give you the understanding that it might shift around a little bit. But everything that's listed under the amendment definitely requires an amendment, so that wouldn't change. So anyway, the intent to get all this done would be to first focus on the highest priority topics within this list. And that could be something to talk about today. Um, what are the highest priority topics? Um, so for example, based on past discussions, we think the two items listed under the amendment, our understanding is that those are a lower priority for the immediate near term compared to some of these other items. So as of now, we're not intending to make much progress on the amendment until later in 2021 so that we could focus on some of these other topics first. Um, and within those, you know, those other two columns, some of them might be a higher priority than others. Some of them will be more straightforward to get done than others. So we might focus on some of those first. Um, next slide, please. So related to the discussion of priorities, I wanted to provide a little bit more detail on the harvest control rule that was listed in that framework and addendum column, that middle column. Um, there's been some indication from GARFO and some council and board members, um, some discussion at previous meetings, suggesting that this topic might be one of the highest priorities for the recreational reform initiative. So I wanted to provide more background on what this means to help inform the discussion today. And I've summarized this at previous meetings, it's all in the briefing book, um, but just to kind of give you a refresher, this harvest control rule was a proposal that was initially put forward by six recreational organizations. And um, the conceptual idea behind it is that you would have a range of predefined management measures that are referred to as steps. And there's a figure on the screen here that's an illustration of um, how it would work. So um, you have step A, B, C, and D. It doesn't have to be four steps. This is just an example. So step A um, is that associated with the highest biomass compared to the target level, so the best stock status, and it's associated with the most level of access. So step A is the most liberal management measures. Um, and then as you move down into the left, step B is the most restrictive set of management measures, the least amount of access associated with the um, smallest biomass, the most poor stock status. And the idea behind this proposal is that each step has um, predefined management measures associated with it. And under the proposal that was put forward, it was noted that states 
could have different management measures from each other and from federal waters, but everything would be predefined. So step A, you have this set of management measures in federal waters, and then it also lists the management measures in each state that would be associated with that. And the same thing for all the other steps. And you would determine which step you're at in a given year just based on biomass. How does biomass compare to the target? And so this is intending to address um, some concerns related to stakeholder perception that our current management measures um, don't feel like they are related to availability in biomass because in some cases we have more restrictive management measures under higher availability than we did in the past under lower availability. Um, so this would explicitly tie the measures to stock status. And there's some level of predictability in that you know what the measure measures are with each step and you might not know which step you're at in a given year in a future year but you know what your options are because um, it, it'll fall within one of these steps and then another important aspect to this proposal is that as it's described in the proposal is that the upper and lower bounds so step a and step b um, are informed by stakeholder input so the idea is that step a is the most liberal set of management measures that you would have at the most high biomass, highest availability. And stakeholders would inform that by saying, you know, for this species, this is the most liberal set of management measures that, you know, I could possibly need. I don't need a higher bag limit than however amount of fish. I don't need a smaller minimum size than X inches, for example, and that would inform step A. On the other hand, step D, the most restrictive set of management measures would also be informed by stakeholder input and stakeholders would provide advice such as, if you go any more restrictive than this set of management measures, then we're gonna have major economic impacts, major loss of businesses. The proposal also suggests that maybe there's not even a conservation benefit of going more restrictive than a certain level. Um, this is all conceptual at this point. We haven't analyzed this to see if this would really work the way it's spelled out. Um, but there has been some interest expressed in you know going through that analysis to see if this could work um discussions among staff and the steering committee um we think that you know we could come up with these steps but it would have to be clear that these uh these would just be a starting point from consideration they would have to be regularly reevaluated. we wouldn't be able to for example say we're never going to go more restrictive than whatever we put at step d um so there would have to be, you know, some flexibility within this. But again, the idea is to have these predetermined management measures so that you have that predictability. Um, and also just to emphasize that a, this would represent a big change from how we currently do things because you would be choosing your management measures based on stock status. And you wouldn't be, for example, trying to predict next year's harvest, compare it to the RHL. Um, the measures would not be based on, uh, you know, performance of the recreational fishery compared to an RHL as explicitly as it has been in the past. It would be more explicitly tied to biomass. So again, this is something that's largely conceptual. We've heard a lot of interest in this proposal, and um, we could further evaluate this um, to see if it could work, to see if it could even meet the requirements of Magnuson, where we have to have an annual catch limit and prevent overfishing by um, trying to control overall catch that we have to measure in pounds or numbers in fish. Like how can we make this proposal work within those constraints? We think that's something that um, needs a little bit more evaluation, which brings me to the next slide, which is next steps for the recreational reform initiative overall. So, Again, there's a lot of topics that are part of this initiative, and we have a lot of other pretty important high priority ongoing and anticipated actions for these four species over the next year or so. So the briefing book does include an example timeline, but I wasn't planning to touch on that in detail because it's just an example and it's highly dependent on prioritization, both within the recreational reform initiative and other compared to other ongoing actions. Um, in terms of what do you want us to work on first um, and things like that. So one suggestion for the immediate next step is for the council and commission and GARFO staff to work with a few additional NIMF staff um, who have expertise in things like the Magnus NAC requirement um, 
and maybe MREP expertise, depending on the um, topics that we want to focus on first for the immediate next step. So for example, um, if the harvest control rule is a very high priority for the council and board to focus on in the immediate future, we think it would be helpful to first answer questions about how can we make the harvest control rule proposal work within the confines of the MAGA snack requirement. Um, that could help us determine the next steps, figure out, you know, should this be a high priority? Um, how do some of those other topics fit within that? Um, and we think that would help us um, moving forward. Um, and so that's the, the staff recommendation, again, for the immediate next step is to focus on that um, if that's what the council and board would like to do. Next slide. That's basically all I had for my presentation. And next, the intent was just to open it up for discussion of next steps. Um, we can talk about that recommendation for Council Commission and GARFO staff working with additional NIMF staff to focus on the harvest control rule, if that's what the council and board want to do. Um, <clears throat> we don't necessar necessarily need an explicit action today or a motion to move forward. Um, we'll move forward with these next steps as presented, unless a different path forward is approved during the discussion today. Um, and with that, I, I'm happy to answer any questions and I can provide more detail on anything that I gloss over if needed. Thank you. Thanks, Julia, I appreciate the presentation. Um, it, it seems to me with that intersect with Magazin that that working group would be a would, would be a good first step. But let's open it up for uh, questions before we determine what the path will be. Does anybody have any questions of Julia? And um, Pat, I don't know if you see the hands raised. I'm trying to help you get to see the hands raised at the very top of your attendees pop out list. Yeah, you should have a hand like there should be an outline of a hand that's in black. Yeah, if you click on that little hand, that little black outlined hand, you should be able to see oh, them. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I've got them. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so uh, the first three um, uh, on the list are Jason McNamee, John Clark and Mike Luisi. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I thought I heard thought I heard my name first. Um, thanks for the uh, for the report, Julia. Um, I'm definitely interested in in the uh, that harvest control rule idea, and I think the suggestion here uh, is a really good one. Um, I'd offer two other quick thoughts. Um, you know, on the slide it said the steps would be kind of set based on stakeholder input um, and i just think there needs to be a i think that's an important part and it needs to be balanced with you know uh, some sort of regulatory setup that um you know won't put the stock in jeopardy as as well and i'm, I'm guessing that balances um where you would end up anyways uh with this group um, and one other quick thought is there's actually, I've been thinking about this a bit and um, I'm aware of some work going on at the Science Center with Yellowtail Flounder and the development of kind of an interesting tool uh, by some scientists at the, uh, at the Science Center for Yellowtail Flounder. And so I'll just kind of put that bug in your ear as um, I think there's application for what they're working on with yellowtail flounder in this situation as well. And I'd be happy to provide um, less cryptic <laughs> information uh, after afterwards if if uh, folks are interested. Great, thanks, Jason. Uh, Julie, did you need to follow up with any of that? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got uh, John Clark, then Mike Luisi, Martin Gray, and Rick Bellavan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Julia. Uh, just to clarify, this definitely gives you a knowledge of what the uh, regulations would change to based on the steps, but in terms of stability, you could still end up 
changing fairly often depending on the stock status, or does this smooth that out somewhat also? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess it depends on um, how many steps there are and, um, but yes, as you get new stock status information, there is the potential to change the step that you're at every time stock status is updated. So it could still change frequently, but there's still some level of predictability provided that you know ahead of time what measures are associated with each step. Great, thank you. Uh, Michael Easy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thanks for your presentation, Julia. I guess, I guess where I am right now with questions is I'm trying to figure out we, you know, we've been talking about um, rec reform for a number of years now, and I'm trying to get a sense, uh, both from a council perspective and from from the state of Maryland, as to when. So nothing has been initiated. I mean, we we've supported the policy board and the council has supported the continued development of the rec reform initiative. Um, for the last couple of years, but at what point do you think, Julia, that we need to init initiate an amendment or or addenda um, frameworks? Are are we not there yet? Or does does staff need to continue to develop um, concepts before we before we start something up officially? Because I I mean, and 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I just want to make sure that, as far as process goes, uh, that we're that we've got a plan. I know that it's on the Mid Atlantic Council's um, priorities list for 2021, um, as far as you know, developing this initiative even further. But I don't know if you can give us some perspective from the staff uh, level at as to when you would need you know decisions you know, to, to put forth a, a formal document. I hope that question made some sense. Yeah, great question. Um, Maya, can you go back to slide five? So the, um, in October, the council and the policy board had a joint meeting and did initiate a framework and addendum and an amendment. Um, and I'm, yeah, there we go. So. This table lists all the topics that were part of the motion that the council and the policy board already passed and approved for getting all of these things done. The only thing that's different is that staff are recommending doing some of them through a technical guidance document rather than a framework and addendum. But an action already has been initiated by both the council and the policy board. So um, staff do feel like we do already have the direction that we need that you know, moving that we should move forward with all these, and these are all priorities. Um, just the intent behind kind of having this discussion and talking about next steps is there's a lot on this list, and there's a lot of other things um, happening with these species. So we just want to provide an update of what we think is the best path forward for getting all of this done, because there are some concerns about staff workload between the council, the commission, and GARFO to get all this done. So. We're operating as if, you know, these are already all priorities. The framework and addendum have already been initiated. So just how can we work within that to um, kind of um, get these all done? We're not going to work on everything all at once initially. Just focus on what we think are the highest priority um, or, and or the most straightforward, most helpful things. Um, and there's, again, the suggestion for how to do that um, in more details in the briefing book. but just wanted to make it clear that we don't need to initiate any sort of action today because that already happened back in October. Great, thanks, Julia. Uh, Tony, do you wanna follow up on that as well? I think actually Julia covered everything that I was gonna say, Pat. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. And Mr. Chairman, if I could just a quick follow up, Mr. Chairman, that'd, that'd be great. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, Julia. And it, it, you know, it's amazing what you forget. Um, and yeah, thanks. Thanks for the uh, the reminder that you know we 
we have approved the continued development uh, of these options um, moving forward. And so, you know, I guess I guess where I am with it, you know, I'm I'm trying to figure out, you know, where we where do we start? There, there's a lot of things here. We we have a lot of other op, um, activities going on with summer flounder scout black sea bass and bluefish. And so I guess that's what we need to think about as far as, you know, prioritizing these, um, these different uh, measures uh, going forward. So, yeah, thanks, Julie. I appreciate the, uh, the reminder on the, on the initiation of, of these actions. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Mike. Uh, next on my list is uh, Marty Gray. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, Julia, for your presentation. Um, I appreciate all the hard work that's gone into this, and um, I'm supportive of the concept going forward. Uh, my question is just out of curiosity, Julia, it was probably in the briefing materials, but you mentioned that six recreational groups um, supported this, and I'm just curious as to who the, what you know, who, who those groups are and given the diversity of our recreational stakeholder community and all the different species they interact with um, i'm curious who they are and how they might represent our coastal recreational community if you if you have that available yeah just um give me a second i'm pulling up the initial document they initially put it forward as part of um a different action and the um, let's see. Okay. American Sport Fishing Association, um, Center for Sport Fishing Policy, Coastal Conservation Association, Congressional Sportsmen's Foundation, National Marine Manufacturers Association, and the Recreational Fishing Alliance. Okay. Thank you very much, Julia. Thanks, Marty. Uh, I've got um, Rick Bellavance, then Chris Bat Savage, and Roy Miller. Uh, go ahead, Rick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a, a quick question. I was wondering if uh, Julia could explain to me what, if any, uh, role uh, the New England Council might have in the working group uh, participation, just to get a, an idea on that. Thanks. Sure. Um, at this stage, we had envisioned it just being Mid-Atlantic Council um, Commission and GARFO staff and just a few additional folks. Um, from other parts of NIMS, maybe from headquarters. Um, you know, if the goal is to focus first on the harvest control rule, we thought that would be the best way to do it is to just have it be that smaller group of staff first to first try to answer questions about how can we make this work under Magnuson. Um, and then when we get further into developing specific alternatives, um, maybe we could think about what other folks we need to bring in. Um, but because we're just you know, focusing on those initial questions and just the the four species that are jointly managed between the Mid-Atlantic Council and the Commission, um, we hadn't planned to bring in the New England Council um, at these early stages. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Chris Bat-Savage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Julia, or I think earlier you uh, said that you know, some, some of the uh, the items on this uh, table uh, might be of higher priority uh, to, to the council and, and policy board. Uh, and then there's others that are more straightforward uh, to, to do and, and also uh, will, will help the process. I was curious to know um, for the, the last item under framework and addendum, uh, changes to the timing of recommending federal waters measures, uh, would, would that Kind of fall under the category of being a pretty straightforward um, uh, issue to to address. That that I think you know, well, I guess it'll be up to the council and board to determine whether they, they want to pursue it. But would that be um, be one that's uh, maybe a little more straightforward uh, than than some of the others on the list? Thanks. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it could be. Um... It, and another thing about these topics is that a lot of them are potentially intertwined. So if we change the timing of when we recommend federal waters measures, that also relates to how we use preliminary current year MRIP data, which is um, listed as a separate topic, but it's, it's related. Um, so there's considerations related to 
to that, like what data you have available. Um, it would require some probably minor changes to the fishery management plan because that timing part is spelled out in um, some parts of the, the fishery management plan for the specific type of conservation equivalency where you can waive federal waters measures in favor of state waters measures that's been allowed for summer flounder for several years and is now an option for black sea bass as well. There are parts of the FMP that relate to that that do spell out the timeline. Um, so for that reason, it would require a change to the FMP and it would require a framework and addendum. So that would make it a little bit more involved than if we could just do it through a technical guidance document. But even within that, that's um, you know potentially more straightforward than some of the other topics because I think mostly it would just entail you know really thinking harder about the pros and cons of the data that you have available at different times of year um, and you know how that would play into the process. Great, Chris, do you have a follow up on that? No, that that answered my question. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I've got Roy Miller and Eric Reed. And uh, Roy, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Julia, while this, while these three columns are before us, I wanted to move over to the amendment side. You mentioned that that would be a lower priority. Of, for instance, recreational sector separation, and yet, as I think about it. Some of the actions we've taken thus far um, for bluefish, for instance, and to a lesser extent for summer flounder, have shown we've already dipped our toes into the waters of sector separation. And I'm wondering if um, by giving us a lower priority, are we in, in effect saying that future consideration of sector separation in our measures will wait? until we uh, take action on a this proposed amendment? Or are we gonna handle sector separation in the recreational fishery on a sort of ad hoc basis as it comes up, like we have done in the past? So that's my question, thank you. Thanks, yeah, I can respond to that. Um, I mean, the, the intent was just, uh, not to say that we're deprioritizing it, but just say that we're focusing on some of these other things first for the more immediate ne next steps. And then it would be potentially later in 2021 that we would um, pick up that particular amendment and start developing a scoping document and moving forward with that. Um, so that it is something that we do plan to move forward with just maybe on a slower timeline than some of these other topics here. Um, and that's how the Council and Policy Board had talked about it back in October, but if the group wants to revisit that, then you know that's open for discussion too. Great. Um, the last uh, on my list is Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate that last question and answer. Um, but my my question is about the harvest control rule itself I mean to me something is missing in that concept the concept that's supported by the six groups step D is the most restrictive measure based on socioeconomics that can be tolerated without loss of business uh, however the biomass status could require a step E which means no fishing at all and you know that that has to be in any harvest control rule that's in place in some of our commercial fisheries that we use now. So my question is, would the six support further development of a harvest control rule if that step was included? Julia, if you're talking, you're on mute. Um, I wasn't talking because I don't I don't feel like I can answer that question. <laughs> I feel like that's a question for the groups that put that forward, and I don't think I can answer that for them. But that would be something, you know, we still have to prevent overfishing. Um, so we might have to consider something like that as part of the um, further developing that concept. 
Julia and Mr. Chairman, this is Adam Nawalski. Unfortunately, I don't have the ability to raise my hand right now. I'm still listed as an organizer from earlier this morning. If you'd like me to respond as having worked with those groups, I'll be happy to do so. Um, yeah, go ahead, Adam. So uh, part of one of the things uh, with that most restrictive set of measures that the groups that I've worked with have definitely advocated for is that one of the things we've learned in rec management, uh, learned it with weak fish, uh, we learned it on the commercial side with northern shrimp, is you get to a point with a set of measures that there's just no biological benefit anymore. Uh, or what we've learned with summer flounder, that the path we think we go down could actually become more destructive biologically by going in a particular direction, such as larger maximum sizes. So Mr. Reed's comment that that set of measures should incorporate something about biology is 100% on point. Uh, and the addition to that, uh, the most restrictive set of measures that industry can support, uh, there's a second part of that that would include uh, without providing tangible biological benefits. Great, thanks. Thanks for that, Adam. Filling in the blanks. Um, I've got Doug Caymans and then uh, Roy Miller and Tom Fody. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Um, since Roy opened the door, I thought I would step in uh, and continue to beat the drum uh, regarding sector separation. And although I realized that we dipped our toe regarding the splitting of of bag limits for bluefish between charter and recreational. I still feel as though us discussing sector separation amongst four species is a very dangerous precedent to be setting, especially since one third of our membership has voted it down at the South Atlantic Council. And I prefer to put off rec recreational sector separation as long as possible and have it as a discussion amongst the entire commission. And I realize we're here as the policy board, but rather than targeting these four species, I'd rather debate sector separation as a commission, uh, its merits and its dangers, and uh, then do it amongst a committee of four species. Uh, and so I'll just continue to beat that each time sector separation comes up until I get my way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> We'll look forward to uh, uh, more of that drum beating later. But actually, um, I think that's a good comment, Doug. I mean, it's, as you know, we're as just standing or sitting up here in the northeast corner, um, kind of away from these species, but uh, thinking about the precedent that it would set, I think it uh, may actually deserve a broader conversation with the policy board at a later date. Um, last hand up is Tom Foley. I think, Roy, did you, your hand was up and then went down. I'm assuming you're all set. I'm all set. Okay, thank you. Tom Foley? Yeah, my follow-up is to Roy's question. Um, we did this on Bluefish without actually going to public hearing. It was an arbitrary decision made at the time by the National Marine Fisheries Service that we could do this. But there really was no input from the public at the time. It was basically, a, we did it at a board meeting. And I was very upset over the fact that we do this. So I really think if we're going to go down this road, we need to set up rules of how we do this and how we basically take care of this before we do another se sector separation without going out to the public. Good, um, thanks Tom. Um, I don't see any more hands. Julia, could you go back to your slide with the staff recommendation, please? Yeah, um, Maya will have to do that for me. What slide is that? Um, Oh, sorry. Um, the last slide. Yeah, the, number eight. Perfect. Great. So um, I, I want to come back to this recommendation by staff based on the comments. Um, and several people did touch on uh, the conversion with Magazine. I think if we were um, going to move forward with this, we wouldn't need to do so with a, uh, with a motion, just an agreement. Uh, to uh, develop this expanded working group um, uh, to evaluate how the harvest control rule uh, would, in fact, uh, work under Magnuson to determine if there are any other issues as well. So um, does anybody object to moving forward uh, with the staff recommendation? 
seeing no hands here and no objections, um, I think we have consensus to move forward with that recommendation. So uh, anybody have any additional items as it pertains to rec reform? And Mike Lisi? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think it's for process, one, maybe I should ask the council as well. Um, uh, you know, it, just so let me ask the council, is there anybody that objects to moving forward with the staff recommendation? And I, I don't have the ability to see hands raised. So Tony if, if or Pat, if you see somebody raise their hand, please let me know. Yeah, no, no hands are up, Mike. Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll assume that um, the council would support that based on consensus. Thank you, that's all. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, so with consensus of both the policy board and the Mid-Atlantic, I think um, we've got a direction uh, to move forward with a, with a working group on this particular topic. Um, and seeing no additional hands, um, I think what we will do is we will um, end this joint meeting uh, of the policy board and the Mid-Atlantic Council. Um, and I would remind everybody that we will be standing in recess, the policy board will stand in recess uh, until February 4th at 1.45 p.m. So with that, I wanna thank everybody uh, for your time today. Uh, it was a good discussion and we'll reconvene on the 4th. Thank you very much.